and it basically comes down to okay it basically comes down to uh this slide and this entire talk for the next 45 minutes basically is just going to be this and so we're going to start off by defining these things and then i might talk about them a little bit and then i might uh sketch a proof uh so basically uh this is a um joint work with Abel Lacaban and it's on the archive we've put it up on the archive about a month ago so all of the extra details and if i make mistakes okay so basically um you can all go home now no, no, I've, I've done my talk uh okay so <laughs> uh basically a few things one of them is throughout this talk uh q is going to be generic no it's the roots of unity no secret number theory no p addicts or you know strange non-characteristic zero fields uh, everything's going to be over C, and uh, Q is not a really unity. And basically, this states that there's an algebra isomorphism between these two algebras. The scan algebra, so this is a Kaufman bracket scan algebra, just a bog standard one, and something called the high rank Ashton Wilson algebra. Okay, and what this does is it takes the um, Ashton Wilson algebra of N, is isomorphic to the scan algebra. Of the n plus one punctured sphere. So you take a sphere, you remove uh, n, n plus one uh, disks from it, and you take the scan algebra. And the isomorphism sends the essentially generators of the scan algebra to the generators of the Ashkey Wilson algebra with an annoying minus sign, which basically comes down to, I mean, not particularly profound, it's basically convention. And basically, one way to think of this one is the Ashkey Wilson algebra uh, is defined essentially to do with orthogonal polynomials and all that sort of stuff. And it's basically algebraic. And the skin algebra is obviously an algebra, but it's defined graphically. It's defined in terms of skeins and so uh, links and surfaces, and it has like little drawing relations and you mess around doing drawings and resolving crossings and you have lots of diagrammatic stuff like Joan Wenzel Rider moments. So one of the ways you can think of this theorem is it basically gives a topological interpretation to the higher rank actually was an algebra, or it gives it a graphical count. Uh, I'm going to now slowly go through. Firstly, what I'm going to do is just define both sides of this correspondence. Uh, the first side, left side, should be familiar to most people, and the right side to at least one person in this audience, two people. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so the first thing I should point out is that uh, the scan algebra, I'm taking the scan algebra of the n plus one punctured sphere. So we take a sphere, and then we take uh, n, uh, we're going to take n plus one to be, say, five in this example. And what you do is you just take, uh, um, take out five open disks uh, from your sphere. So you've got some, uh, some boundaries. And what we do is we choose a, one of these boundary components, uh, these punctures, so this one up in red. And what you take is the sphere and we use that boundary to flatten the sphere onto the surface. So we take the sphere and we put it onto the page and it ends up looking like this. So the boundary goes around here and this is basically the n plus one n thing going on. You end up using one of your punctures because it's basically just there to turn it into a nice flat picture. Um, so uh, that's just uh, one thing. And so when I talk about the n plus one puncture sphere, uh, you're going to really think of it on my flat. So, you know, we don't have to think too three dimensionally or anything like that. But the first thing I'm just going to remind you the Kalpen bracket scan algebra. So what you do is you take an oriented smooth surface, like our punctured sphere, uh, when then you thicken it, so you cross it with a unit interval, like in this picture here, and then what you do is you consider uh, four more linear combinations of framed links. So the framing means that basically you're really thinking about a uh, ribbon, kind of, you give a framing to every point, or like you have little ribbons, uh, but because we usually view this thing flattened onto the page, we usually just give it the Blackmore framing. So just assume the framing is parallel. Uh, and we can now, instead of having frameworks in this three dimensional thing, we can just um, project them down onto nice diagrams uh, with, um, uh, okay. So what we do is we consider these um, links up to um, obviously isotopy uh, as is usual. 
And we also impose the Kelfman bracket scale relations. And so what they basically say is if you look from the top down, if you have a crossing, you can resolve this crossing into two things, uh, links that no longer cross, uh, Q and Q minus one things. And if you have a uh, trivial circle, which isn't wrapped around a puncture or anything, it's basically just in a trivial bit topologically, you just get rid of it at the cost of a scalar. Uh, and also this thing is an algebra. The algebra is given by stacking upwards. So you just take your surfaces and stack them on top, thick and surfaces and stack them on top of each other, which is the equivalent on the projected version of just drawing the knots on top. Okay, so uh, that should be familiar to uh, most people. Um, and, uh, or the other thing is the Kaufman bracket one, we're not doing anything fancy. And if you take the Kaufman bracket, you renormalize, you get the James polynomial. So it's very, very classic. So another classic result is the result of Bullock, which is basically uh, what the generators of this uh, scale algebra are. So basically, if you think about the relations, whenever you have a crossing, you can get rid of the crossing. Whenever you get a trivial loop, you can get rid of that. So they told you, you can certainly um, reduce the number of generators a fair bit. What Bullock says is that basically, you have one generator for every non-empty subset of your n punctures, and so of n. So what you want to do is you want to take, say for example, our subset is one three. What you do is you make a simple non-crossing uh, curve that goes around one and three, and there's a choice convention. You can either join it up so it goes underneath anything that's missing. So there's two and two's not in this set. And you can go either underneath or above. And you just need to choose a convention. So we're going underneath. And if you consider all of these, this will generate um, your scale algebra. So you basically just have a bunch of um, simple curves. OK, a few things. Are we going to use the set A, which is the subset? And sometimes we're going to need to order the points. So we're going to have to say, and so we're just going to say that uh, A is just some ordered um, set of points from 1 to n. OK, uh, so the um, next thing to do, so we've got to find the left hand side of the isomorphism. Now we're going to find the right hand side. Uh, so we're going to start off with the classical case. So the classical case is, is n is 3. So the side um, that corresponds to the four function sphere. And basically, we can find the Ashley Wilson algebra just to be the generator, it has three generators, A, B, and C. And it has some central generators, C1, C2, uh, C3, C1, 2, 3. And you have some relations. So this kind of looks like a whole massive page of relations. But if you look at the relations, they're not that difficult. You say, take the first one, you take A. And then you have a commutator and quantum Lie bracket, B and C, is equal to some central element in your algebra. And you cycle around. So A becomes B, uh, B becomes C, C becomes A, and then you get the second one. And something happens over here. And you see you're up with three of these. And you have one more relation. This uh, is called the quantum Casimir. And this is some horrendous relation, uh, which I'm not going to talk about too much. Uh, but it's okay. So uh, there is a, a slight issue with the Ashley Wilson algebras, which reminds me of a certain quote uh, from a children's book. Uh, Alison, Alice Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll. What happens when you get a logician to write a children's book? When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more than that nor the less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be the master, that's all. Okay, so basically the problem with Ashley Wilson algebras is there are multiple different definitions and everyone calls all of them Ashley Wilson algebras. Uh, for a good account of this, uh, I will refer you to uh, this uh, reference here, uh, but they're not too bad. Basically what happens in the case is, depending on which version of the Ashley Wilson algebra you have, the C1, C2, C3, C1, 2, 3 can sometimes be parameters rather than central elements, and sometimes they're slightly different elements, central elements. Um, also, uh, we don't always have this relation. In this paper here, 
uh, this, um, they refer to the R Ashley Wilson algebra um, as the special Ashley Wilson algebra because you were quotienting by this relation. And so throughout the rest of the talk, um, Ashley Wilson algebra will mean what I want it to be. And <laughs> that's that. And the next question, you might have a similar question is, okay, so the classical Ashley Wilson algebra, you have lots of uh, possible slightly different definitions. And you also have possibly the same problem with the higher rank Ashby Wilson algebra. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy someone else's. <laughs> uh, or more exactly, I'm going to base my uh, generalized higher rank Ashby Wilson algebra on a embedding of the Ashby Wilson algebra into uh, multiple copies of the quantum group of SL2. Okay, so first thing is we have take ourselves the quantum chasm. Uh, so that's just the central element, it turns up all over the place, it's kind of important. And what we use is we use this in uh, this, this is a central element of UQSL2, and we use this, and this is going to be the image of Ashkin Wilson algebra in terms of these, is going to generate all the things in terms of the quantum Casimir. So C1, for example, we just take the quantum Casimir and we need something in UQSL2 uh, to the third tenth of power. Uh, so we're just going to put in ones every once. Uh, the same C2 is going to put the uh, chasm in the second position, C3 in the third position. So C12, uh, okay, sorry, this is, should be A, uh, our first gen uh, for our first non-central generator. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take the co-product of the Casimir. That's going to now live in two slots, and the final slot's just going to be one. And the same with two, three, we're going to put the co-product of the Casimir in the second position, second and third position, and again, a one in the first position. And also uh, C1, two, three, uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to take co-product twice. So take co-product once, take the co-product again on the first factor, and then just do nothing on the second. So that's all very nice. There is, however, one question, which is this here, C1, two is A, uh, C23 is B, I believe. And what happens to C? Well, what happens to C under this embedding is, um, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, not hopefully too much more complicated, but basically what we do is we take uh, the co-product of our Casimir again, and then we want to put it in slot one and, and not in slot two. And so what we do is we apply this map tau to make a gap. Um, not very effectively because it's no longer going to have one in the middle. Um, okay, so what we do is we take uh, I to just be a subalgebra which contains all of our Casimirs and co products of Casimirs and all that sort of stuff. So we have E, F, K, K, and the Casimir. And we just have uh, that the tau is an action, a co module action of UQSL2, and it's defined using these horrible formulas here. Um, so it's a map. Okay, so in particular, C13 doesn't look quite like the other ones, uh, because in the other ones, uh, when the uh, number isn't in the set, uh, we just get ones everywhere. But when we apply this map tau, we are going to get things in each three set. So uh, I will come up with a version which doesn't have this problem um, by considering it in the way the intensive product, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so, um, and now I'm just going to generalize it. I'm going to uh, reference this to the B, the Clerk, the uh, Van der Weyde, um paper. And so basically, if you have this definition, uh, you can generalize by playing replacing three with N. So we take AWN to be the subalgebra of UQ SL2 to the power N generated by these lambda A's for all um, subsets of our N points. And the definitions for these are kind of the natural ones you would come up with. So if you say, for example, lambda two, you just put a Casimir in the second element, fill everything else with ones. If you want to take a gap, make a gap, you use this tau map again, everything else just gets, you could put ones in there. If you want to make a gap that's too big, you have to empower this tau map twice. And so you can kind of generate all of the um, and, um, generators this way, and this generates some subalgebra which we will call the rank n minus two Ashkey Wilson algebra. The n minus two is because basically the classical one is n is three, and that's going to be the rank one. So, uh, so classical is rank one, and sorry for n minus two, n n plus ones. They're kind of annoying, but that shouldn't be too difficult to keep track of. Okay, 
So I'm back to my uh, theorem. And so we now hopefully managed to define the scale algebra, the HP Wilson algebra. And these are the, just these simple curves that generate our scale algebra. And these are these uh, things that you use by taking our quantum Casimir and throwing co-products and this map tau at it. And so we generated all of these things and then they match up. Okay, so this is, before I carry on, is there any questions? I haven't lost you all so far, that's good. Okay, so before I go on to the proof, I'm just gonna talk about a few essentially corollaries. Um, sometimes they're not corollaries directly of this, but some kind of middle stage of the proof, but okay. So the first thing I should mention is probably this. This isomorphism uh, commutes with the action of the braid group for people who like braid groups. Uh, the skein algebra, you have a natural action of the braid loop, which basically um, rotates the um, punctures and then kind of twists your loops around. Uh, and the Ashley Wilson algebra has an action of the braid group given by conjugating with the R matrix, and this isomorphism respects it. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Okay, uh, the second thing is um, we have that this Ashley Wilson algebra is contained in the centralizer uh, of. Um, UQ SL2. And also, as a kind of middle stage of this isomorphism, I can, we were able to construct some the graded vector of space dimensions of our scale algebra. But the first, I'm just going to briefly mention the first thing, which is that, as I said, um, one of the points of this theorem is to give you a kind of a diagrammatic system for prove it, for working with Ashley Wilson algebras. So I'm going to do this um, to basically reprove a result of de Klerk. Uh, which is basically that the Ashley Wilson algebra, so the classical Ashley Wilson algebra, is defined essentially as satisfying a bunch of commutator relations and then this extra relation, this generalized. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a generalized commuter. So, this in the closure version, that was over there. Uh, but you have this generalized commutator relation. And so, what you have is you have a commutator relation, not for every single A, um, S, A, and S, B but for S, A, and S, B, which are made up of some of these subsets. And these A, A, A1, A2, A3, A4 are kind of ordered. And probably the easiest way I can actually do this is to very interpret this result is to tell you, so basically what you have, so we're just gonna do one case. So A is uh, A1, A2, A4 uh, union, and B is A2, A3. So what we basically have is we have uh, these sets A1, A2, A3, A4, which are subsets of N, uh, the endpoints, and they are kind of ordered from left to right. That's what the condition was essentially meant to do. And what we have is that S, A, S, B is just going to be uh, the simple curve going through. Uh, also, we don't need that all of the points are all of the endpoints, but any points which aren't included in the union of A1, A2, a3 and A4 are basically just going to be points above this diagram. You can just kind of shove them upwards out of the way. They don't really affect the calculation. Okay, so what we do is we write down um, what SAB is in terms of our scale algebra, uh, and we write out what SB, uh, SA is in terms of our scale algebra. And then what we do is you just use the Kalfman bracket scale relations. We've got two crossings here, and we've got a crossing there and a crossing just above it. And we, each of them is going to resolve two ways to get us four terms, which are these things. You stare at these terms and you basically look at them and you realize that these are all these um, S's that we wanted. And what you do is you just take Q of this first line uh, minus Q to the inverse of the second line and we basically get the result. So basically you draw out what the commutator should be, resolve the crossings and you're done, which is a pretty quick uh, proof and obviously you have two other. Cases. Okay, so this is probably a lot easier than the original method of proof. Okay, so the second thing I'm just going to very make an mention for people who like centralizers is you just have the, the centralizer is just uh, this and we just have it's contained in it and that's just like another corollary uh, because I guess we were talking about centralizing in the first week so I thought I'd mention it. Okay, the final thing and I should probably Hurry up a bit is that okay? Uh, dimensions. Okay. Uh, what you do is you 
If you have an infinite dimensional, uh, an algebra, you consider it as a vector space. If you have a grading of this algebra, you can construct a series which encodes the dimension of each of your graded pieces of your algebra as a nice C, called a Hilbert series. Okay. Uh, if you, um, in an Ashkew Wilson algebra, a skein algebra, you don't actually have a grading, we have a filtration, but you just take the associated graded algebra. And what we can do is we can basically compute what all of the dimensions of each of the graded pieces is. And it's this formula here, which has lots of n chooses all things. Okay, this uh, result basically comes from kind of looking at the middle stage of our isomorphism, which we're about to get to. And one thing I should point out is that this is a result for genus, for genus as well as punctures, but you do need at least one puncture. So you need to be able to flatten your uh, service, I guess, is one way of thinking of it. Uh, and using this, uh, I essentially uh, use this to compute what a, pre a presentation uh, for the rank two Ashley Wilson algebra would be. Um, and also, I guess, the uh, five functions. So anyway, I'm not gonna talk about that because I should get a move on. Uh, because I said I'd prove this thing. I'll give at least a sketch of this proof and I haven't so far. Okay, so the first thing I should point out is that this uh, they were generalized of a classical result for n is three. So when you have the classical Ashley Wilson algebra, you have that it's isomorphic to the scan algebra of the four punctured sphere. And basically, uh, the proof uh, is basically you have a pre known presentation for this, you have a known presentation for this, and they kind of match. So you relies on you knowing a lot about both sides. And in particular, this isomorphism essentially factors through a map to the spherical Daha of type CV. One C one. Okay, so and in particular, I think this bit kind of came first, and then someone pointed out this bit, and then you can look at it directly. Uh, basically, as for who proved this, I don't. It's a little bit fuzzy. Um, I think basically to Williger probably get some credit, and possibly P Peter Samuelson for kind of noticing this sort of stuff. Uh, and there's a few other names around. Um, it sort of floats around the literature. Okay, the problem is this is really not going to generalize as a proof because this proof would basically amount to knowing what presentation for your Ashley Wilson algebra is and for your skin algebra for general n and then kind of matching that up. Unfortunately, we don't know either presentation for either side. Okay, so that's just not going to work. Uh, so we're going to do it a completely different approach. Okay, so um, which is we're going to consider this isomorphism as a composition of three maps. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the skin algebra and we're going to include it in something, I consider it as a color algebra, something called the stated skin algebra. Okay, uh, so this is still kind of topologically defined. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a uh, map from that to the reflection equation algebra. And you're going to take n tensor pod times the graded uh, n fold tensor product of this. And so that's going to be map one. Then we're going to take this thing, we're going to take the reflection equation algebra, and then we're going to basically turn the reflection equation algebra into a quantum group. Now we can't take the whole of the quantum group, we can only take the local finite part, but that's not too much of a problem because our Ashley Wilson algebra really lives in that bit anyway. Okay, so we're going to do that. And then the final map we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this braided tensor product and turn it into the honest standard um, tensor plot. And when we do this, uh, we're going to end up with something that gets us from the uh, generator here to our quantum chasm. So we're basically just going to compose uh, three maps. This takes it from the kind of topologically algebra to algebraically algebra. And then this is just messing around uh, with algebra. Okay. Uh, and uh, as you can see, each of these stages gets you to some kind of explicit thing. Uh, so the first thing I should probably say is firstly, we'll just focus on the left-hand side. So we're just gonna focus on map one. Uh, I gave it a different name in the paper, but it's gonna be one uh, here. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find what this BQSL2 tensor um, tilde n is, because it's kind of looks complicated and it needs a definition, right? Okay, so. Uh, the reflection equation algebra, I should point out one thing. Ashley Wilson algebra is we have the problem that there are too many things which are all called the Ashkew Wilson algebra. In this, we have the opposite problem where everything has too many different names. 
so this B is because Majid, who, along with I think Lubashenko, um, essentially defined this sort of stuff, or at least worked with it a lot, he used to call it the braided quantum matrix algebra. Uh, and there's probably a few other names that I've missed out in the literature. So everything seems to have about three different names. Okay, so the algebra is not particularly, it's just an algebra. So we have some generators. We in our generators, we have four of them. We'll put them in an I matrix called the K matrix. Okay, and we are gonna, it's a reflection equation algebra. So it's gonna satisfy something called the reflection equation. Any surprises there? And reflection equation algebra, uh, equation, there's different versions with fancy spectral parameters and all that sort of stuff, but this is just the kind of basic reflection equation. And it kind of turns up when you stop bouncing particles of mirrors and things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and so what you do is you take the reflection equation algebra and you also take, well, we're taking SL2. Um, and so in SL2, you have a determinant is one. That's usually the relation. And so we again have a relation. We have a slightly braided version of this relation. And um, we just have this determinant with a key. This is basically the reflection equation algebra. The other thing I should probably point out is we have uh, going to need is one particular element of it called the quantum trace. In the earlier week, at least week one or something, we heard lots of complicated things about quantum traces. I don't mean that quantum trace. I literally mean take the trace of this matrix and dump a couple of keys. Okay, nice and <laughs> so that's not um, fancy quantum trace. This is just dump. Uh, so that's Hopefully, just that's just an algebra, and it's a very classical algebra. Uh, you find it like they worked on it in the early '90s and stuff like that. So I'm fine as they would first doing quantum loops, and uh, sometimes it's kind of dual for it. Uh, you have it, it's a Hoff algebra, uh, has a copartment, which is quite nice. Uh, it's basically just tensor matrices. Um, in fact, the co and the coproducts are a lot nicer than the coproducts for the multiplying matrices. Okay, I should. Um, then just say, it's right at the beginning, earlier on, uh, I said that this SA would be sent to this thing. So we've met this quantum trace, it's just this dumb trace of this matrix with some Qs in, and so I should probably define what the hell I mean by this to the power of K minus one and the subscript A, because that's, uh, that's a lot of notation there. Okay, so first thing is, um, the power of K is just what you think, what you do is you just keep applying this co-product, k primes. Okay, so what's this subscript a? Okay, so if you take uh, the co-product of k, it lives in um, BQSL2 to the power of k. What we wanna do is we want to make it live in to the power of a. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put it all of the terms in the right places. A is our um, subset of endpoints again. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the g, uh, factor here, and we're going to put it in the i j, and then we're going to fill up anything we haven't filled in just with ones. Okay, so probably this sounds more complicated than it really is, so I'm just going to give you a quick example. And so what we're going to do is to say we take one, two, and four, so we take a uh, co-product twice of x, and this is using Swedenborg notation, so we get three of them, and we just put them in place, one, two, four, and then we have a three missing, so we just put a one there. So it's kind of pretty easy. And in particular, there's no towels. Towels all disappeared in the wash. Um, think these only have, uh, only have like non one factors where there's actually uh, related to the correct functions. No one else. Okay. Uh, I'm also just going to say about the braided tensor product. Braided tensor product is twist equivalent to the normal tensor product. Um, basically, what you do is you kind of twist it by the R matrix. Uh, so more exactly, you take tensor product as a vector space is just the st standard tensor product, but you change the multiplication. And you change the multiplication uh, by acting on it, not on the middle two factors, so B. So basically you just have something that looks like you've messed around with the multiplication a little bit. Okay, and so that's what we mean by the braided tensor product. We've got halfway to understanding um, part one. Um, map one, we are now understand what the right hand side should be. Uh, the triangle, oh yeah, the action, you have a kind of a joint, you have an action. So A and B are H co-module algebra. So you have this triangle, it's defined. And so you usually just act on it with your joint action, I think, or co-action. Oh, no, no, no. In this case, you just use um, co-module. Okay, uh, so um, first thing I wanted to do is, uh, I said that in order to get our map, 
We didn't want to go from the Skane algebra directly to this reflection equation algebra. We wanted to go to something called a stated Skane algebra. Okay, so what the hell is a stated Skane algebra? Um, well, firstly, um, it's basically uh, kind of, it's not in one, it's kind of by Lee, uh, Tang Lee. And so basically the idea is this, you take a Skane algebra, and when we define the Skane algebra, we assumed all of our frame lengths in our second surface were closed. Uh, this has issues. The main, main problem is if you have, say, a surface with four punctures and you want to work out what it is by maybe, in fact, you know what an annulus is, uh, it doesn't really work very well because, say, you want to divide your surface, uh, you take a closed loop and it's now not a closed loop. It's not quite that good. So, we don't have a way to kind of build up our skein algebra by considering the skein algebra of simpler surfaces and then just kind of combining them, like you're having a nice homology thing. Uh, so the idea is very simple. Uh, you allow your skeins to be open, so have ends. And in particular, they're allowed to end at the boundary points. Okay, so we are allowed to have non uh, links. Okay, so what we have is, and in particular, the stated bit comes from the fact that these tangles are allowed to meet the boundary, and where they meet the boundary, you give them a state, which is either plus or minus. So this is stated, uh, and we need to, what we have is they have the same relations as we had before, we have the Kaufman brackets Brackett's game relations, but we now need some extra relations which involve the boundary. And what it basically says, if you just have this U, this bound, and meets the boundary, we can get rid of it. If, there's, if the states are the same, you just get rid of it with a zero, and if the sites and states are different, you just use a Q as a co coefficient. And we also have this relation. Uh, and this makes everything kind of nice and consistent, and this is all very good. Uh, we now then look at the papers, and we basically realize that this state is gain algebra of an annulus is just isomorphic to the reflection equation algebra. Okay, so what should I? Okay, so we have an annulus. Okay, if we have a closed tangle that's kind of uh, boring, we can get rid of it because that's the Kaufman bracket relation. If we have something like this, we use our extra relation open it up and so we can think of it in terms of I don't know there's something and um, we have a linear combination and if we have something here we can always kill it so basically the status gain algebra is generated by just some lines of the annulus that just go across with some states and um epsilon one and epsilon two can be uh plus or minus one and so these are these betas so these betas and this Proposition is just an isomorphism which sends this uh, to this should be a k. Uh, so the uh, k uh, some generator here with some coefficient. And the proof is kind of really simple. I don't really should probably say this, but basically what you do is you take uh, uh, this thing. Uh, okay, so I, I'm not going to prove this. I'm just going to say very quickly what happens to the only thing if you take the annulus. The skein algebra of the annulus is just got a single generator that goes on a puncture. And so what you do is you just apply our non-trivial relation and then we use this map. And this goes, lo and behold, to the quantum trace with a minus sign. Uh, so this um, is essentially just kind of easy. Okay, I'm not going to, and what I'm going to say is that the point about the state of the skein algebra is, is we can cut and stick properly. So uh, we take our result for one puncture and we can soup it up to a result about n punctures and we end up with this graded tense product and we end up with this thing we just defined. Uh, and I'm not gonna say, how long have I got? I'm not very long. So I will just point out that the proof is basically the same. Just do the same as you did before. Keep doing it loads and loads and loads of times and you end up with something like this and it's got some horrendous uh, thing at the front and just organize the thing at the front, simplify it a bit, and get my like answer. So it's not that difficult to prove. Okay, so basically that's what map one is. If you've lost track, it doesn't really matter. We just need to remember that this thing goes to this thing. And more exactly, if you want the isomorphism to be uh, straight, what it goes to is the UQSL2 invariant part of this. And then there's a strict isomorphism. And this is basically where I started because this isomorphism generalizes. Uh, so in case of SL2, you can take some reductive Lie group 
And instead of puncture stage, you can also add genuses by using something in the elliptic double. And so you still end up with a size of the here. And this is to do with factorization of monogy and uh, my thesis and um, game categories and all that sort of stuff. And it's basically the result I started with. I just use this version, which uses state scale algebras, which is a kind of a concrete case, just because this is the case we were interested in. But this is okay. So very quickly, I'm now going to basically just explain what the um, rest of the map is. The rest of the map is kind of technical and not very good for a talk, so I'm just going to explain it kind of quickly to you. Okay, so the first thing I should probably just say is uh, the next isomorphism is between the reflection equation algebra and is locally in the finite part of UQ uh, SL2. And so we're just keeping the gradient test product uh, the same here. And so I should just basically quickly define what the locally finite dimension and part is. So we have UQ SL2 acts on itself using the adjoint action, which is this action here. And basically the locally finite elements are the elements where if you take this action, you get something that's finite dimensional. So it's just like some sort of algebra. And it's generated as an algebra by K, FK, E, and the Casimir element. And if you remember right at the beginning, when we define our map how we have this I subset and it's basically just a part. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, well, and this locally finite thing is a by count algebra. The thing is we're gonna use a slightly weird code product, um, not the standard code product, we're gonna use a different one. And that's why we're gonna put a bar onto it. And this has this complicated formula and it basically turns out to be this nasty thing here. Okay, um, why use this thing? Well, because this is essentially the right co-product that matches up with the co-product we already had. We took lots of co-products of the quantum trace. And if we map through our uh, map between the reflection equation algebra and the locally finite part of UQSL2, uh, this is what you actually maps to. So the co-products match up. Doesn't match up to the standard co-product. Okay. And so basically, we're just going to use this matching up. This matching up is actually just a classical result. I think it's called the Vosso isomorphism, uh, which is that at least for SL2, you just have an isomorphism. And this isomorphism sends these generators to these. And in particular, the quantum trace gets sent to the classical. And if you take uh, Lots of um, this um, co product thing, we just send it to this uh, weird uh, co product we've just defined. Okay, so this is like a classical result. In general, if you put like Q as a root of unity, it might not be injective. And if you play around with other uh, E groups, you might have to go open a classical layout uh, quantum te group textbook and figure out if it's still true. But at least for this case, it's reasonably simple. Okay, so. That's the map two, uh, which is basically apply classical result from the literature. And the final one is a map three. And what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this braided tensor product and replace it with a non braided tensor product. Okay. Um, generally speaking, if you uh, luckily we do actually have a map, um, this is we can unbraid the thing. So in particular, we can define a map which take, goes from the uh, braided tensor product to the non braided tensor product. So if you have one puncture, what the map is, is just going to be inclusion. We had locally a finite and to the braided tensor product on one, that's just do nothing. Okay, so you just include, and for n is greater than one, we just define it by using n, uh, like inductively using this map here, which is this horrendous looking formula. Well, it's not that horrendous, it's just you have this actions and these u and v are essentially just uh, the components of the r matrix but technically there's always a bit of an issue with um uqsl2 because it's not actually quite quasi triangular so uh you know but that doesn't really matter too much well it does but that's kind of technical okay so that's basically uh but the point is about this unbody map is it's an injective morphism of algebras and it's compatible with co, co multiplications And basically using this, you do a horrendous bit of playing around with algebra and you come to the conclusion that this thing here is just uh, the uh, general radius of these actually rules and algebras. And so what we end up with is this correspondence that goes from the scale algebra 
over here, the S2 Wilson algebra, which contains the generators, two minus of the generators over there. Oh, go, we have a nice algebra isomorphism. And I think that's probably uh, me done. So, are there any questions? Are there indeed questions? So, when you calculate your uh, Huber Poincare series, you have a fibular algebra, but what's, what was the degree of the generator? What, uh, the, uh, what are the degrees of the generator? The degrees, oh, yeah. The, um, on the left hand side, the scale algebra, you just count the number of punctures the thing goes around. So, the, the, um, the generators just are determined by the punctures they go around, and you just count them. So, if it's S, I don't know, one, two, three, it's got degree three. Um, this thing, you give the Casimir degree one, and then you take the co-product, you end up with something degree two, and you basically figure out. And so you end up with this um, thing. What we actually do is we, uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, you just give the Casimir degree one, and then like do the obvious thing. For the but so what, what would be the associated graded algebra? Uh, so the associated graded algebra is just a formal thing, because you get filtration, because you get this quantum determinant. So, I mean, actually what we did is we calculated the Hilbert series for this thing. Um, so then you have a graded isomorphism. And so um, here, um, that's what you kind of, we actually calculated it for this. Um, and you get, in this case, you get this quote, you have to quotient by the graded determinant and that would kill your graded structure because you'd be losing graded degree. So you don't actually, you end up with a filtration, so you have to take the associated graded, which I guess is not that nice, but hey. Central lights are few as it. I was wondering if you had a, a filtration such that the graded alpha was actually polynomial alpha. Okay, for the for UQSL. If you take USL2 and you look at the Delonite fertilizer also, yeah. it's also a fit term. Yeah. And then you have graded algebra, which is yeah. the algebra of polynomial numbers. Yes. And this is a good one. Yeah, you should have, because basically you should have the UQ bit, it should just be a detonation. So you just queue the forming things. So I don't think it actually changes the Hilbert series. No, it's not easy to... to, 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 to. Put a, gra uh, a, gra in a grading with the queue. Yeah, I mean, you don't put a grading in the when you have a queue, you have a filtration and then you just associate the grading, which means you don't quite know, you don't have a very good description of what the associated graded algebra is, I guess, apart from yeah. you maximize the rank. The, the, but, for my question, what are the degree of the generator? So one for the Casimir and then you two for, for example, in, in the Asterism 3, C12 will be degree two. C23 will be degree two. I mean, you can essentially, you minimize the possible degree it could be. And for the generators, it's fine because you just count the size of A is, the set of A is. But if you take um, other things, then you have to figure out, like you define the degree by the minimal, I think is the minimal degree, I guess. There's a question online from Paul. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. We should be able to hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, hi, Julian. I have a uh, rather general question. There's an algebra um, that's uh, called the Q-Onsager algebra. That's a mild generalization of the ASCII-Wilson algebra, AW3. And my question is, um, could this Q-Onsager algebra be isomorphic to a Skine algebra for some topological object? Do you um, um, I'm not really sure. It's likely it should have some kind of topological <laughs> thing. I mean, in particular, when I talk about, I wouldn't know exactly what it is, but it's possible it does have one. Um, you can't just kind of completely soup up trivially, but um, you might just do something. <laughs> Let, let me remind everybody about the connection between the q onsager algebra and this ASCII-Wilson algebra. The, the ASCII-Wilson algebra had three main generators, A, B, and C. Uh, if, uh, if you eliminate, let's say, the C, you end up with, um, so you can do that ending up with the A and the B and one of those central elements as a third generator. If you just pretend that the that central element is a scalar for the moment, um, the, the A and the B satisfy 
some two, a pair of cubic relations that are called the Q Dolan Grady relations. And those are the defining relations for the Q Ansager algebra. So there's a natural homomorphism of algebras from the Q Ansager algebra into the ASCII Wilson algebra. The two generators for the Q Ansager get sent to the A and the B for the, uh, the Q ASCII, the ASCII Wilson. Uh, so we, we see that the, uh, the Q Ansager algebra is a, roughly a, a kind of homomorph, homomorphic pre image of the, uh, the ASCII Wilson algebra. I mean, I would feel that somehow, I mean, if I remember, Q Ansager algebra has something to do with the reflection equation algebra of the affine SL2, right? Yeah, that so is I correct. Don't know, yeah. I don't know if you end up with something which treats it in, instead of the reflection equation algebra of SL2, maybe you have something in the weighted case for like the affine one, but I don't really know. Um, and I don't know quite. Um, what happens on the kind of left hand side? Um, I think there's I don't know what happens on the left hand side. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just mentioned it as an interesting. Yeah. I um, mean, it's definitely an interesting problem. I mean, you know, and it would definitely be trying to figure out what you could do because, I mean, you can define like skein algebras for like um, affine systems, but it doesn't mean it would correspond. I don't know. <laughs> haven't thought enough about pure single algebras, but yeah, you can define them for like, you, I mean, you basically need a ribbon. If you have a ribbon category, then you can define a scheme algebra. So, um, and your scheme relations are determined by the representation theory. So maybe you could end up with something. Okay, thank you. More questions or comments, Nicola? Can, can you try to find a microphone? For you, algebra between two and three. I don't know the name of this guy. Um, um, well, this one here. Yeah, this one, yes. Yep. Is it off, co-associative, quasi-triangular, I mean, it's everything? a quasi-triangular. Um, it's, uh, it's got um, the co-products determined by this. I think it's by algebra. I don't know. I, I think it has an S. I think the, um, I mean, essentially, it's just uh, a sub-algebra of UQSL2. So it probably, you get the same antibody, I think. I haven't double-checked, but yeah, it's, it's basically just... Uh, the thing that is isomorphic to this half algebra here. It's surprised because you have one Casimir, you have the is one when you make one, two, four, you have a one, it's a third space. So that surprised me a bit. So it's why I'm asking you, your universal R matrix for these guys, what um, is the form of that? The universal R matrix for these three algebras is basically the same. Um, you don't really do anything with the on matrix, but there is this complication about <laughs> UQSL2 not actually being quasar triangular, so you end up working at a completion. But basically, if you restrict the local finite bit, it starts becoming genuinely quasar triangular. Okay. So it actually makes problems easier, <laughs> um, not harder. Um, but yeah, it's just a half algebra. Because as an up algebra, I, be, I believe that in my mind, because maybe, maybe I'm wrong, it was unique deformations, the UQSL2. Which is at the white most is a unique deformation of SL2. So I was surprised you say it's the same up structure, it's the same R matrix, it's the same thing. So I, I mean, this is just a sub algebra. UQ SL2 locally finite is just a sub bit. It's the locally finite bit. Okay. So it's it's the, which is why it inherits everything from its thing. The difference is you can put a slightly different co-product structure on it, which yeah, the co-product is different. You know, so it's, it's my surprise. Um, the Drinfeld twist, that's just to do with the... We just made it up, okay. uh, no, the <laughs> Drinfeld twist has not really got anything to do with anything, apart from if you start thinking about how this behaves with respect to the group actions. I, I one structure, the new co-product structure is a Drinfeld twist yeah. from the UQS, so usual. It's one. what I believe, but okay. in this case, the R matrix is different and the, everything is different. You must check the co-associativity again and everything. So Yeah, I think basically, question. yeah, I think... So the point, the reason why you have this difference, the actual different bit is this braided tensor product. Because when you take the braided tensor product, it's a twist, twist equivalence. And when you take the twist, you conjugate the R matrix by what you're twisting by. So you end up, but so you still have a half algebra, you just end up with the Can be not be co-associative, for example. You must have a co-associator. You must find the, forget the pentagonal relations for the twist to, to show 
Yeah, it's but the, the point is that you choose your twist to be uh, a co-cycle, so you do end up with co-assistivity. Okay. I mean, in this case, you're twisting by the R matrix. And so the co-cycle condition is basically the R matrix condition. So, and you have an R matrix for SL2, so. Um, okay, yeah, I think it's mass the square root of the universal R matrix, but yeah, something like uh, that. Yeah, I think. Uh, square root with code, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm. I'm yeah, also you may take an inverse depending on your conventions, but uh, but yeah, basically you just twist. So the point is that the UQSL2 likely finite bit is easy. The, this understanding this braided tense product bit, um, you don't necessarily have, um, and it's just in this particular case when you twist by the R matrix, you still have a morphism that's injected. And you have an explicit form for this twist? Uh, what? Do you have an explicit form for this twist? Uh, yes, it's just the one. Uh, if you look at, say, Donnan's paper on twisting of algebras, you just apply essentially the R matrix to factor. So when you do a twist, you take two lots of the Hopf algebra. So you take set n is two, and then you just put the R matrix in factor place two and three, and you twist. It's it's kind of explicit, and it's just the braided test lot of stuff. Okay. which is in magic's book and stuff. Since there's coffee waiting for us, I suggest that we <laughs> thank Juliet again. Thank you.